Are you a real estate investor looking to sharpen your skills or a newbie looking to become one? You're in the right place. Welcome to Where Should I Invest? Real Estate Investing in Canada with your host, Sarah Larby. Welcome back to another great episode with a great guest, Gary Hibberts. Some of you guys may have heard of Gary, might have seen Gary speak before, might have attended one of his real estate events in Ajax. And maybe you guys work with Gary. Gary is a realtor, but investor and mostly an investor who has been super successful and uh, and is now semi-retired. I would say um, he has one of the best concepts of semi-mini retirements where he'll go away for like a month at a time and then come back and then take another little mini um, long vacation and uh, he calls them mini retirements. Anyways, really cool concept. If you guys are interested in knowing more about that, we actually did record it at the Right Club podcast and we talked all about that concept. But uh, with that said, guys, super excited about this interview and uh, thank you for tuning in again this week. Really, really appreciate it and uh, enjoy the interview. Welcome to the show, Gary. How are you? I am great. Sarah, thank you very much for having me on. I'm excited about this. I know, me too. So I spoke at one of your amazing events recently. So you also host meetups and uh, and uh, networking events out of Ajax. And uh, can you actually, you know what, before we even get started, and I usually don't even start with this, but I, th I thought it was uh, um, one, one of the best put together events that I've, I've been to. And so I want to congratulate you. What's the event called? Uh, so it's called Smart Home Choice. And so we've been doing um, our mastermind events that we have out here in Ajax for the last... What do we know? We're getting into into nine years now, so it's been it's been going good. And uh, and thank you very much for making the, the the trek all the way out to Ajax to do a talk to our group. Everybody, by the way, loved your talk, and uh, and I actually learned a couple couple new things as well too. So so thanks for sharing. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. So Gary, for those of you that may not know you or have heard of you, who is Gary? Mm, big question. So so who Gary is? Gary is a, a real estate investor. Gary is a, a real estate agent. Um, like I said before, I'm an owner of a real estate investment club out here in Ajax. Um, I've also started uh, recently a, a private lending company. We did that earlier this year called Deep Pockets. Um, and then recently, I'm uh, a partner now of a real estate brokerage called Our Neighborhood Realty uh, in Oshawa. So I've got a, I've, I've got a few different hats that, that, that I do wear. But uh, in a nutshell, that, that's who I am keep very busy. So real yeah. estate allowed you to leave your job. Talk to us about that, how you got started and, uh, and the day that you actually left. And I know there's going to be probably a little bit of a story there. Yeah. So we'll start back at the beginning. So back in, in 2008, I was, uh, I was kind of living paycheck to paycheck, hated doing what I was doing. And uh, the problem was I just didn't know how to actually get out of that full-time job. And, uh, back uh, there was a day that was called black monday and so i went into work it was a typical monday and if you remember back in 2008 the u.s market had their crash but in canada we didn't really have that big of a a hit or an impact in our real estate market but when i went into work um you know sat down at my cubicle doing my thing and the manager called one of my co-workers in and then he came out of the office with this infamous pink slip and i was like oh yeah this shit is on. <laughs> so, so all day people were getting called into the office. And, uh, and I remember just this, this sinking feeling in my gut that I may potentially lose my job. And me and my wife had recently just purchased our home. We had two young kids and, and I couldn't afford to lose my job. And so anyways, fast forward at the end of the day, uh, the manager comes out and he goes, okay, you guys who are left, you guys are safe. Don't worry about it. Uh, you can go home and you're back here tomorrow. And I remember driving home and I said, never again do I ever want to feel like that, where somebody's in control of my financial freedom or future. But again, the problem was I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I went and did a few different things. I did currency trading, I did stock markets, I did commodity trading. I was trying all these different things, but nothing was working for me. And so while I was doing this, I was putting myself into a lot of debt. And so I went into the bank um, to do a, a refinance or take all my debt, put it in my mortgage. And 
while I was in there, I was actually looking up at this, the, the index chart. I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but essentially this kind of shows you what the stock markets have done and what interest rates are, are doing. And when I looked and realized what inflation was doing, and on average, it was anywhere from two and a half to three percent to sometimes maybe 14, 15 percent. And I did a quick math on what I had made in my raise the previous year. And I was like, hold on a second. My raise was like only one point six percent. And that was when that light bulb when I was like, mathematically, it is impossible for me to outpace inflation by having a job. And then from there, the rest is history. I started, I got into real estate investing back in 2008 when everybody told me not to do it because the market was, you know, everybody thought it was going to go down. But I mean, if you look back at it now, I mean, geez, I wish I kind of had started earlier. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> uh, but, but, but that's what got me into it was this, the, the realization that I couldn't outpace inflation by having a job. That's really cool. And actually, you know, you were talking about that big chart at the bank and I remember seeing that and I am like, why is real estate not on that chart? It's not on that chart, real it's estate it's and real estate investing. They, it's yeah. like a secret. They don't want you to know how to do it because they want you to invest in their stocks and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? And that's a good point, right? And so one of the things that I always ask people or from, you know, if I do seminars and, and do like a fast start training class for people who are getting into real estate for the first time, is I'll ask, you know, is the system broken or is it built by design? And, and, and before I thought it was broken, but it's not. They've actually designed it that way. I mean, like think about when, when kids get out of high school and they go to college or university, what's the very first thing that they're presented with? Credit cards. Yeah. And they have no idea how, you know, how to use it and interest rates or what a credit report is, which is probably one of the most important things. And mm -hmm. they don't teach that stuff. So yeah, it's built by design. Yeah, no, I absolutely believe that as well. And you know, like one of the really crazy things is my mom was going to the bank once because I was like speaking on this real estate stuff nearby where she goes and she knows her teller. And she's like, you know, do you mind if I put like this little poster or Sarah speaking in a couple of days? Because I had a lot of friends asking. <laughs> Anyways, this was years ago and the bank's like, no, we can't. Like it's actually like going against what we're trying to sell people, which was mutual funds and stuff. And she's like, well, don't you sell them real estate too? They're like, yeah, but we really want to sell them the mutual funds. I'm like, oh my God, you know, it's a whole business. Right. It is. It is. And yeah. so, and so when I look at my portfolio today, like I don't have anything in mutual funds. I'm completely out of the stock markets. Um, anything that I had in RSPs from when I used to work at the bank, you know, it, it's gone into either first or second mortgages. And, you know, I've really kind of diversified everything within real estate and, you know, maybe different markets, but that's, that's what I believe in. Yeah, no, absolutely. And they call it real estate because it's real. <laughs> and you and and you've tried you try like you mentioned you've tried other things before as well, and so have I, right? And like real estate just kept coming back as the thing that seems and has worked the best out of the things that I used to try five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. So and okay, so fast yeah, forward, you know, you've acquired some properties. Can you just walk me through like how you how you scaled? Um, from property number one to, you know, at the point that you left your job. Yeah. So, so let me share a story with you just exactly how broke I was. Okay. So after I'd done that refinance, they pretty much said, Gary, listen, we know that you can't handle credit cards or lines of credit. So we're going to take all that and we're going to um, just rip it all up. And I'm like, okay, cool. I don't want nothing to do with debt anymore. Cause at that time I thought debt was bad and, and that's what I was taught. Um, and so when they did that, uh, a friend of mine, we were talking and we, he, I'd mentioned him like, I want to get into real estate cause I don't know what else to do, but this seems to be working because this is what's bailing me out. And so the very first property that I bought, a friend of mine had actually had brought it to me and it was, his, his dad was living in there. He was going through a bit of a divorce and he's like, Gary, can you buy this property for my dad? So back in 2008, I actually remember this was a very short window where you can buy a property zero down, um, and, uh, and for your amortization. So the down payment at the time with the closing costs and everything was like $3,000. <laughs> so I couldn't afford it. So I actually had to do a joint venture with a friend. <laughs> so he put in 1500, I put in 1500. That's how broke it was. So fast forward now, the next property I bought, I was able to save up some additional money. I did another property with, uh, with my brother-in-law in Scarborough. And, uh, and for that one, um, it was a burr. But at the time, I didn't know what a burr was. I had no idea. I'd never gone to any kind of real estate investment clubs or classes or anything like that. And, uh, and by, after a year had gone by, I realized that I didn't like it. I didn't like real estate investing. And not because the strategy wasn't good. It just, I didn't know what I was doing. So I stopped. We saw that one. 
Um, we made a little bit of money off it, but not much. And then from there, I, I went online and I did a search on a better way to invest in real estate. And I came across rent to own. And then that's what I really kind of fell in love with was, was the rent to own model. And I did that, mastered that and studied it for about four years. And while I was doing that, I was buying these properties with joint venture partners. And I didn't have the money, but I knew that people at where I was working or friends or family had some, some money or they can, you know, they had their lines of credit. And so I would joint venture with them. So I was bringing the deal and then they were using their name and their, and their money to actually partner with me. And that was when I realized that, wow, the power is really in the deal, not so much the money. Right. No, and that's how I was able to scale. So, so walk me through that. Like what, like when you had your portfolio, what did that, that look like? Um, in, in regards to what type of properties you mean I was buying? You had the rent to owns, like, you, like, is that how you retired essentially by having enough cash flow from those properties? Yeah. So the, it wasn't so much just the cash flow. So the cash flow was helping me, but what it was doing was it was actually getting me closer to actually leaving my, my, my full-time job. And so for me, the goal that I had, I'm really big on whiteboarding. If you take a look behind us, my whiteboard is back, just like my, my personal and my, and my business goals up there. And so I was whiteboarding everything that I wanted. And for me, what I wanted to do was to be able to have enough cash flow that covered my mortgage payment and taxes and insurance. And so once I got there, that was when I had the courage enough to leave my full-time job. Now, I didn't have enough money to, you know, pay for food and stuff like that and groceries. But I was like, well, I got good neighbors. So if, <laughs> if I have to, I'll just go over there and, you know, beg and borrow some flour and, <laughs> you know, and, and bread or whatever, whatever I needed. Um, and then, and, but, but what was really important at that time as well too, that's when we started smart home choice as well during that transition. And, uh, and then I got my real estate license. So I transitioned from TD bank to being a realtor and then that realtor also sustained my income while the cash flow from the real estate as well too. That's how I was able to, to, to quit my full-time job. That's amazing. Yeah. So when you're starting out as a realtor, and there's probably a lot of people that are thinking about starting or not starting, did it help you the fact that you already were an investor and that you were already investing? Like, is that, it was that like a, an asset to be able to find more clients? It was, it wasn't, it, it was definitely an asset to, you know, having my real estate license. Um, and then also in line with smart home choice as well too, and then training new investors that were coming in. So what we were doing, we were doing these fast start training classes, bringing in these new investors that wanted to learn about in real estate investing. And what we were doing, cause we, we knew, and cause I was more focusing on the fears that I had, which was bad tenants. Um, were they going to, you know, destroy my home? You know, and at the time too, in the beginning, I didn't know about certain things. Like there was these myths of, well, you can't kick tenants out in the winter time and all these yeah. different things. So while I was educating new investors coming into the market, I was also educating myself as well too. So it was this journey that I was going on, educating myself and then saying, Hey, look, this is what I'm doing. I want to be completely transparent. I'm learning this as I go, but, but I'm building this team of lawyers and accountants and um, real estate agents and mortgage agents. And, and, and that's how I really built the business by just true transparency, doing the club and then bringing in clients that way. Yeah, no, I mean, the club, the club is a great idea too, because it, you know, and even just the, when I look at our club, we become that person that's always showing up. And I think indirectly we're building trust and we're building a brand and probably the same thing with you, right? With your club, you're building the trust, you're building the brands. And I yeah. think, in return, you're going to get investors, you're going to get clients. Yeah, exactly. And, and the great thing as well, too, is that while you're, you're helping other people, you're also educating yourself. And, and there was this one saying, one of my early mentors was Jim Rohn, love Jim Rohn. And, uh, and when I was going to work, I used to listen to him like every single day. And one of the things that really um, was important to me and, and one of the sayings that he had was help as many people get what you want and you can have every and anything you want yeah. and so I was like okay you know what I'm going to really hold true to that I'm going to see how true this this statement really is and so from when I heard that back in 2009 to where I am today it is probably I mean there's so many great quotes out there but that one I hold very very dear to my heart yeah no, absolutely. because it's so true 
you know, and, and so it doesn't matter what you do, whether it's real estate investing or, you know, whether it, you're, you're working on your nine to five job. And even though, you know, I talk about leaving my nine to five job, I know there's lots of people out there that love their nine to five job, but while you're there, if that's where you want to stay, then just do the best at that job and help as many people, you know, get to what it is that they're looking to get to. Yeah, absolutely. I love, I love that quote because it is very, very true and very accurate. And when you, you look back and interview and talk to so many successful people, it's yeah. because they've helped so many other people and that's what made them successful. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you've, you know, obviously been around for a little while in the investment uh, real estate world, you've yeah. seen lots of different strategies somebody wants to get started, like, is there a strategy that you would recommend that they start with? Yeah, it's a good question. So I don't believe that there's a right or wrong strategy. I think that whatever strategy you decide to do, just make sure that it suits your lifestyle. You know, so like I said, when I first got into it, I was doing the birth strategy, didn't like it. Not that it wasn't a bad strategy. I just didn't understand it. And I didn't know what I was doing. And I wasn't educated. Then I got into rent to own, which is the strategy that I loved for about four or five years, wrote a book on it as well too. Um, and, and that's what allowed me to get out of my full-time job along with being a realtor. Then from there, I went back to the Burr strategy, um, did, did a number of Burr strategies. And you know, there's one that I did where I pretty much got all my down payment back, got all my renovation costs back, and you know, the bank gave me an extra 30,000 on top of it. So that's a phenomenal strategy. However, I didn't want to continue to build my business with the Burr strategy. So then I started looking at apartment buildings. Um, and I took a course on it, um, went and took a little couple of apartment buildings with a friend of mine who owns a few. And then I realized like, eh, I don't know if I want to do this one either. And again, nothing wrong with the strategy. It just didn't suit my lifestyle and what I was trying to do, like where, what my goals were. Because my goals more are, like I love doing the podcast like you're doing. Um, I, I love the mentorship part of it and, and helping other people. And so then I had to take a step back and I talked to one of my early mentors and he's like, you know, I see what you're trying to do and where you're trying to go. But he's like, well, why don't you just kind of get into the private lending space? Because that's a more passive form of investing. And so when I took a look at it, that was one of the reasons why I ended up starting Deep Pockets early this year, because it made more sense for me. Not that it's a right or wrong strategy, it's just for what I was trying to accomplish in my life. It allowed me to be able to do, invest my money passively because I already built my wealth with real estate, um, but I didn't need to build anymore because I already have the properties there. Yeah, right. absolutely. If that makes sense. It really does. But you know, can you go through a little bit, like there's, there might be somebody out there wondering like, what, what does this mean? You know, lending it out and, and private investing and... Can you walk us through like what that looks like and yeah. how somebody can do that if they want, if they say, I want, I have money and there's a lot yeah. of people that come even to the right club, like they're just lending out their money. Like they don't want to be active investors. They want to be passive and there's right. money out there. But how does that, how does that actually work? Yeah. So, so the way that it works is that there's, there's lots of families out there where they, they, they own their own home. They may um, have come across some, say, maybe some financial difficulties, or maybe somebody's lost their job, or, or maybe they're self-employed. So there's a number of different things that may potentially have happened with that family. And they have good equity in their home, and they're trying to either get a second mortgage or maybe get a HELOC or a line of credit, and they're unable to. And this is where now a private investor like myself or anybody that's listening could then lend their money, whether it be uh, from the RSPs or from a, a line of credit, to then uh, in, in lend that to a family. And usually you, you're lending that and the funds that you're making on it is any, or sorry, the interest rates you're making on it is anywhere between eight to you know, 15, 16%. Um, and it's a very fairly passive form of investing where really all you do is you sign some documents and that's it. And it's usually a one year term for the most part. But keep in mind, it's only usually interest only payments. So you're missing out on the appreciation that uh, an investment property is going to give you. You're missing out on the mortgage pay down. Um, and so you have to keep that in mind. So always make sure that whatever your, your goals are and whatever investing strategy you're moving into, it, it, you're, you know, you're holding true to what it is that you really want. So for me, I had to take a step back and say, I want a certain amount of cash flow. 
And so to scale my business, I would have to buy a number of properties and I just didn't want to get to a hundred doors. I, there's lots of investors out there that are doing it and I, and I, I commend them. I think it's phenomenal, but it just wasn't what I wanted to do. That's all. No, absolutely. Then, you know, there's different strategies and different people pick them for different reasons and any strategy out there, as long as you don't have analysis paralysis, just pick something and go do it. That, that is my recommendation. That's the key. But there's tons of people that are successful in every single strategy, just like there's people that had bad experiences in every single strategy. So what are some of the risks associated with private lending? Well, I mean, the, the big risk really would be, you know, um, investing your, your money into a property that uh, is the, there's enough equity in there. And so now if the market changes, you know, can you actually get your money back? So that's something that you really have to pay attention to. Uh, number two, um, you know, there's a reason why these people are looking for private funds. So you got to make sure that you're either yourself or, or your mortgage agent or whoever's bringing this deal to you has do their, you know, done their due diligence to make sure that uh, they're, they're going to make these payments. Yeah, absolutely. Now, are you also working with investors like flippers that need private money or is it strictly people that are in need? that need it for their primary residence? Right now it's just uh, people that are in need for their primary residence, but we've had a few investors come to us saying, hey, look, you know, I, I'm looking to do a flipper. I'm, I've, I've got this project that's that's going on. So, so we're looking to expand that as well too. Okay, so just out of curiosity, because I don't know exactly your business model, but how do you find the people that need the money? Mm, good question. So what I do is I'm really good at partnering with people who are smarter than me. <laughs> so, so with, with deep pockets, I've got uh, a mortgage agent, um, that, uh, that has been finding a lot of these deals. Um, and, um, and we had a system in place and so we just kind of just came together and, uh, he, so he brings the deals in and we have the investors and, and we, and we do a marriage. So I'm doing some of these deals myself and some of our investors are doing some of these deals as well too. So you're, are you brokering the deals? Um, I'm not. I'm not brokering it myself. It's just Deep Pockets is the is the company that is essentially putting these deals together, right? Okay. Yeah. So my then, mortgage broker is the one who's actually brokering these deals, and then we send them out to our investors. And say, hey, look, here's a here's an opportunity, um, either a first or a second mortgage. Uh, are you interested? And they'll then reach out to us, and then my partner will then explain the deal to him. I'm just really facilitating that whole thing. Okay, got it. Right. Now, if somebody wants to lend out money, like, because obviously with private money, like there's like different interests, like you were mentioning, are you doing points as well? Like a point system of like asking for like a percent up front or 2% up front or anything like that? Uh, depending on the deal. Yeah. Depending on the risk. Yes. So, so, so my partner will do that. Absolutely. Is it easier to find investors or people that need to borrow the money? You know what? It depends on where you are in your business. You know, I know when I, we first started Smart Home Choice and we were doing the rent to owns, we had all these deals, but we had no investors. And then as the business grew, then we had more investors and then we didn't have that many deals. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's just always this, this, this balance of, you know, do you have enough investors or do you have enough deals? Um, and so right now for us, we have a lot more investors than we do deals. And so now we're looking to expand on that side. And then eventually we may get too many deals and not enough investors, <laughs> right? I guess that's why you're looking at uh, potentially working with flippers and investors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. And then, but, but also, so we've got that side of the business, but then we're also doing a lot of, you know, taking our clients out and looking for properties in the Durham market. Um, I think you also know too, that I'm really big in the Peterborough market as well too. Um, and, and where we do property tours again, so really big on the education piece. We're actually doing one, you know, a couple of weeks from now. And, and the way that we do our property tours, and it, and it took us a few years to kind of figure this piece out, was not to just take them into a property that's on the market and available, but take them into our investors' properties so that they can actually see exactly what our investors are going through. And not just learn from us, but learn from our investors and some of the mistakes that they're making or some of the things that are happening, you know, are going very well for them. And then we'll have our contractor there or we'll have our property manager there and we'll go through three or four different properties, you know. Actually, that's so a they, great idea. Mm -hmm. So they because actually can see for, exactly. Yeah, and it's important for them to see like different things throughout the process, right? So mm -hmm. 
like if somebody's halfway done and they're working through the permit process, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Peterborough permit, like I, I'm dealing with Hamilton right now and it's very slow, but <laughs> you yeah. know, even just like those headaches <laughs> dealing with the city. Well, yeah, it, it, it's a little bit slow in Peterborough as well too, because uh, they recently just made the amendment to their bylaw to now make it easier for, uh, you know, investors coming in to convert these single family homes into, into two units. Um, before it was like a very small area of homes that could be done. Now it's, it's pretty much right across Peterborough, as long as they meet certain criteria that, that the city is looking for. So, um, you know, a certain, you know, um, amount of parking that uh, that's required. Do you also, um, just selfishly, do you also look for cottages for people? Like if they wanted a second cottage, potentially? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I could now because I, I obviously have my own cottage up in Lakefield, like you know. Um, so, I, you know, I do understand a little bit uh, better now in regards to septics and, and wells and, uh, you know, what's a, what's what's a good lake? Is it Shimong or Buckhorn? Is What's a little bit more weedier and all that? But um, but I haven't, but, but I could though. Um, mostly what I'm doing is, again... I would say like probably 80 to 90% of our business now is in Peterborough. We do a little bit in, in, the, in the Durham market, um, a little out in Coburg, a little bit in, in Belleville, but predominantly we, we're doing a lot in Peterborough. And predominantly with investors? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's 90, 95% of our business is investors. So taking single family homes uh, and converting them into two units. And I mean, in the homes out there, they're, they're, the numbers make so much sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love Peterborough. Like I am actively looking there right now as well. And it yeah. makes sense since I've got a property up in Lakefield, like 10 minutes from your place. <laughs> yeah. I, I love, I love it up there as well too. And, and so there's one thing as well too. So we're always looking to see what is the next, next best market as well too. And so I remember in 2017, um, you know, the Durham market was going crazy. Everywhere was going crazy. If you remember, mm -hmm. And so uh, I'll tell a quick little, little story here. So I went into my, my barber uh, to get my hair cut. My regular barber wasn't there. I don't know if I've told you this story now, but anyways, I'll share it with I you. I think again. I heard it. I wonder if you told it on um, when you were on the panel at the right club. Did I? I might have. Yeah, yeah I think I might have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause I think, I think it's an important story for, for people who haven't heard the story. So anyways, he, he, I'm getting my hair cut and he's like, Hey, listen, you know what? If you get into real estate investing, you can make a ton of money. All you got to do is just buy a home, hold it for three months, and then and then you can offload it and you'll make like forty, fifty thousand. I'm like, no way. He goes, Yeah, I'm telling you, you can kill it by doing that. And so, you know, he didn't know I was a realtor, he didn't know I was a real estate investment club. And so I went back to my team and I go, listen, guys, just to let you guys know we are done with the Durham market because the day that you get a tip from somebody who doesn't understand real estate investing is a day that you know that the market is um, oversaturated. And so from there, we went into Peterborough and we were buying homes in there. So, I mean, we sat down, we, we had a conversation with the city um, and, uh, and we knew what was happening in regards to the bylaw. So we did get in there earlier or early before the, the amendment happened to the bylaw, but we knew that it was coming just because that it was mandated at the provincial level that they had to create this affordable housing and they were having this housing crisis out there. And so me and my partner, we bought an investment property out there before we even took our investors there. And we had like 20 people lined up outside the door and wow. they just came in started filling applications. And uh, we asked them, say, Hey, do you guys even know what the rent is? And they're like, no, they had no idea. They just needed a place to live. And, and so we were like, wow, we, we, we've hit something here. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's when we really started doing a big push in Peterborough. This was, uh, around Feb, March of 2017, a, a couple months right before, you know, the market uh, took that big hit. I think the vacancy rates are still like super low. Like was, was it like one something? Like yeah, I, th I think it's even less than that. It, it's really low in Peterborough. And, yeah. uh, and, and the rents that, you know, some of our investors are getting out there is incredible. They're getting, you know, for upstairs anywhere from 17 to 19, downstairs anywhere from 11 to 14, I've heard as high as 15. You know, and, and these homes that we're buying, they're in that in between that three twenty five right now to four four and a quarter range. So and the numbers make sense. That's a single family at that price, and then you got to put in what eighty hundred to duplex it. You know, we got a really good contractor up there right now, uh, and okay. he's doing, been doing a lot. Yeah, so anywhere from what I've seen, anywhere from thirty five forty to to sixty okay. is what they're that's coming in at. Yeah, 
when we, when we first went out there, we were using somebody else and, and their numbers were a little bit higher. Um, but, but there's a couple contractors that we're using out there. So it's, it, it all depends. And that's inclusive of all the permit pulling? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's yeah. pretty good. Well, if you guys yeah. need a good contractor in Peterborough, that carries <laughs> you. <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So Gary, I mean, I could keep talking to you forever because you've got tons of great ideas. Um, but the next part of this podcast is our lightning round. So I'm going to ask you a series of five questions. You're going to give me the first that comes to mind. Are you ready? I am ready. I feel like I'm on a game show or something. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> game show question number one, Gary, what is your favorite real estate investing book ever? Mm, I like supporting local people. I would say, you know, which one really changed my life was money people deal. Stefan Arneo. Okay. You know, I know a lot of people talk about Rich Dad, Poor Dad and, and yeah. some of the other famous ones, but that one, I, I read that one from beginning to end. And that was when I really understood that, that helped me a lot too with my joint ventures. So that was a good book. Good. Yeah. It's a good book. I remember reading it too. It's a good, like easy read as well. Like it, you can read it pretty quickly. Yeah. Awesome. Number two, Gary, what is your favorite podcast? Sarah Larby. Where to invest, invest next. I like that one. Um, you know what? So, so again, I, I like listening to, to local ones, you know, um, there's breakthrough real estate with, uh, with Rob and Sandy. Um, there's, um, which one, the, the well-off one, I think was George. I literally um, just had George right before you. <laughs> on my oh, podcast. are you serious? Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. So I, I like to listen to local ones just because I want to know what, what, what everybody else is doing and, and, and what's happening. And, uh, and it's good to support. I think people that are doing uh, great things and trying to share and help other people. Right. So. Absolutely. Very cool. So Gary, question number three, what is your favorite pastime? So what do you do aside from real estate? That's fun. Mm. So recently I would say I love hanging out at the cottage. You know why? It's not just a cottage. So, so I love see you doing now. I have so much fun with that, but here's what, what I really love is the fact to have my friends or my family up there and to put the phone away for several hours and actually truly reconnect again, that is a, is a great pastime because um, it's great laughing because I'm telling you, that's the best medicine. I think that's what really keeps people young. And so doing that every weekend has been a great pastime of mine since I've had the cottage. I absolutely love it. Very cool. And actually, that's actually how we met <laughs> is at it my is. cottage. It is. <laughs> You're at, you're like, I don't know, you were posting some pictures and I was posting some pictures and then we realized our cottages were like 10 minutes apart. So I'm like, yeah, just come over. And you came over. So that's, that's <laughs> awesome. That's how we met. Just yeah. like showed up at my cottage. <laughs> and we've built a great, great relationship since then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good times and good years to come for sure. Yeah. So, number four, if you lost all of your money and your assets tomorrow, how would you start again? Mm. Um, so what I would do is I would probably be doing exactly what I'm doing now. I, I think I would still want the same mistakes and the same hurdles and the same problems. But if it took me nine or 10 years to build what I have today, then I can probably go back and do it in about two years. Okay, you know? yeah, that's, that's true because your, your skill and your education and all that stuff doesn't go away. No, it doesn't. I remember when I was doing this too, just to finish this off, it was when I was about ready to leave TD Bank and a lot of my friends were like, yeah, but what if the market crashes and what if you lose everything? And I was, I was like, yeah, what if, what if it does? And what if I do lose everything? And I remember when you're not confident enough to actually explain to people, it, it, you know, you, you, you have to really understand the importance of mindset and education. And so now when I look back at it, it's such an easy question to answer because I am no longer scared to lose everything. It doesn't matter. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not relevant to me anymore because you, I can't lose my skill sets. I can't lose the knowledge and what I've learned throughout the last nine or 10 years. You know, it's, once, you've, once you've been exposed to it, it it's, it's always going to be with you. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. So question number five, last question of the lightning round. If somebody has $50,000 and they want to get started, how would you recommend they get started? Um, well, good question. So what I would do is I would set aside maybe $5,000 for education, meaning that I would go to mastermind events like the right club or um, the club that I've got or any, any other clubs out there. There's tons of clubs out there in, in the GTA and put aside some money, go and do that. Then find out who you like and who is, is good out there that you kind of are attracted to. Uh, like you've got a great program rise. 
you know, what's, I don't know how much that costs, but you know, it's a few hundred bucks. Um, and then within five, four to five months, you should be able to pick a particular investing strategy that you like. Then, um, and, and I'd also learn how to do joint ventures as well during, during that four or five months. And then from there, you can probably buy, if you do it properly, like how I did in the beginning, uh, get four or five different joint venture partners. And you can stretch that. And just what I used to do was I used to pay for the closing costs. That's awesome. There you go. Yeah. There you All have right. it. That was a so, lightning though. I, I gave it, those were long answers. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's good, but it, it, it makes sense. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, how do you take that? 50 grand to make it four properties or five properties. And you know, you've got to get the education and the networking and then the JVs. It's a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. You can definitely make it work for sure. Awesome. So Gary, if the listeners wanted to reach out, know more about you, where can they go? Um, you know what, if you want to learn more about me, you can go to my website, which is smarthomechoice.ca. Um, or if you want to get a hold of me directly, you can send an email to me at Gary, G A R Y, uh, at smarthomechoice.ca. Okay, perfect. Any final last words of advice for the listeners? Yeah, it's always action. It is. It, it, you know, the, the best piece of advice I can ever give anybody is just, just take action. Um, don't be scared to make mistakes. Um, you know, procrastination is, is the same thing as fear. Right. So don't, don't let that hold you back, you know, um, and turn the TV off or, and if you're going to watch the TV, then make sure that's educational. Um, you know, I, I remember for several years, for several years, I didn't know any shows that were going on and it was because I was just educating myself. I was feeding my mind. Yeah. So that's what I would say. Feed your mind and, and just get off the couch and, and go out there and meet people and, and learn. Absolutely. You know, it's, um, it's actually funny because I, with a TV thing, I mean, the exact same opinion. I actually got rid of the TV on the main floor. My boyfriend still watches TV a little bit, but like, yeah. I don't even know how that stuff works anymore. Like, I don't even know how to figure out to, how to turn on to Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely brought me to where I am. And like you said it, like, you know, do something. If you're going to watch TV, something educational, mm -hmm. I'm not going to like, you know, bash anybody that wants to watch sports or, or whatever. But, you know, like think of all that time and how you can reallocate it to, to change your life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, you know, and, and that's, I would say the key to it all is education, learning, and then action, educate, action, educate, action. That's so it. It's very simple. It's a simple formula. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. On that note, Gary, thank you so much for being on Worship Invest. It was a pleasure speaking with you and I'm sure there's going to be many more to come and um, we'll have to have you speak as well um, on our platform at the right club as well all right well i'm looking forward to it and thank you very much for having me on your show and uh congratulations to all the su success that you've had um i think you got a great podcast and the guys have a phenomenal phenomenal club I, I was definitely impressed when i was there the last time so keep up the great work awesome thanks gary oh you're welcome thank you Thanks so much for listening to Where Should I Invest with your host, Sarah Larby. Make sure to listen in next time. We'll catch you on the next episode of Where Should I Invest.